The departure of Jean-Claude Duvalier from Haiti in 1986 marked the end of a nearly 30-year dictatorship that had begun with his father, François Duvalier. As Baby Doc fled the country on February 7, 1986, amid widespread protests and international pressure, a wave of optimism swept through Haiti. The Haitian people, long suppressed under the Duvalier regime, took to the streets in celebration. There was a palpable sense of relief and hope as the nation looked forward to a new era of democracy and freedom. The departure of Duvalier was seen as a chance for Haiti to break free from its troubled past and chart a new course toward prosperity and political stability. In the immediate aftermath, there was a surge of political activity. New parties formed, and exiled politicians returned to the country. The Haitian people embraced their newfound freedom of speech and assembly, engaging in open discussions about the future of the nation. A new democratic constitution was established through a referendum. There was a widespread belief that Haiti could now join the ranks of democratic nations and work towards addressing its long-standing social and economic challenges. However, it did not take long for the people to realize that there was still much to be done. Constitution par créant situation dangereuse. The attempt at a free election on November 29, 1987, collapsed in bloodshed. Coups or attempted coups followed one after another. There was a glimmer of hope for establishing democracy with the election of Jean-Bertrand Aristide in 1991. But again, it was fleeting. Even after the return to constitutional order, elections could not be held according to the planned schedules. And when these elections were finally held, they were contested, rightly or wrongly. Opposition leaders refused to respect the mandates of elected presidents and preferred to use the people to strip the government through violence. <laughs> They caused more harm to the country than the incompetence of the elected officials they denounced. Meanwhile, the country's economic situation deteriorated, and the population sank deeper into poverty as if it had not yet hit rock bottom. The democratic bamboche proclaimed in 1986 is now just an insignificant if not bitter memory. Many are beginning to regret the Duvalier years. Baby Doc, returning to Haiti in 2011, was welcomed as a national hero. Others don't hesitate to praise authoritarian regimes like those in China and Russia. Given this failure to establish a stable democracy in Haiti, isn't it legitimate to ask whether a non-democratic authoritarian regime is better for Haiti? Can democracy succeed in a country where the inhabitants are in survival mode? We will dissect the question to seek an answer, but it will always remain a controversial and debatable issue. From the beginnings of civilization and until recently in human history, authoritarian, autocratic, and totalitarian regimes were the norm. Coercive power is the most natural form of authority to impose on a population, although conversely, the individual aspires to live in a democratic environment. Because the individual wants more freedom, the logical tendency is to overthrow authoritarian regimes to establish democracy, so that individuals can have rights and thrive. Promoting the reverse process seems demonic. So, are there cases or social realities that could make dictatorship more appealing than democracy? In countries emerging from civil war or severe internal conflict, an authoritarian government can sometimes impose the order necessary to rebuild institutions and infrastructure without the delays and disputes that might come with a democratic process. Such regimes can make swift decisions, mobilize resources efficiently, and implement policies without facing opposition from a fragmented political landscape. This can lead to rapid stabilization and the restoration of essential services, which are crucial in the immediate aftermath of conflict. Authoritarian governments often prioritize security and can deploy military and police forces effectively to maintain law and order. By controlling the narrative and suppressing dissent, they can focus on nation-building tasks without the disruptions of political rivalries. The concentration of power in the hands of a single leader or a small group can also ensure consistent and coherent policy implementation. 
Authoritarian regimes can implement long-term economic policies more efficiently, without the disruptions of electoral cycles. This is because they do not need to cater to short-term electoral pressures or frequent changes in leadership, allowing for consistent and sustained policy implementation. Examples often cited include China and Singapore, where authoritarian governments have overseen rapid economic growth and development. In these countries, centralized control has enabled the swift execution of large-scale infrastructure projects and economic reforms. But we must be careful. The downside of authoritarianism is significant, often undermining the long-term stability and prosperity it might initially seem to promise. One of the primary issues is the lack of accountability, as leaders in authoritarian regimes are not subject to the same checks and balances as those in democracies. This can lead to corruption, as officials are less likely to face consequences for unethical behavior. The concentration of power in a single entity or a small group often results in decisions that serve the interests of the ruling elite rather than the population. Human rights abuses are another major concern in authoritarian regimes. Freedom of speech, assembly, and the press are typically suppressed, stifling dissent and preventing the public from voicing their grievances. This suppression can create an environment of fear and oppression, where individuals are afraid to speak out or challenge the status quo. Over time, this lack of freedom can stifle innovation and creativity, as people are unable to express new ideas or push for progressive changes. Additionally, authoritarian regimes often use propaganda and censorship to control information, which can lead to a misinformed public and hinder the development of a well-informed, active citizenry. This manipulation of information can create a distorted reality, where citizens are unable to make informed decisions about their own lives and the future of their country. The lack of political pluralism also means that there is little room for opposition or alternative viewpoints, leading to a homogenized political landscape that does not reflect the diversity of the population. Finally, the long-term sustainability of authoritarian regimes is questionable. While they may provide short-term stability, the absence of democratic mechanisms for resolving conflicts and ensuring political participation can lead to pent-up frustrations and eventual social upheaval. When people are denied a voice and their basic rights, the risk of rebellion and civil unrest increases, potentially leading to violent conflicts and further instability. Also, the question arises. How could an authoritarian regime return to Haiti? It's certain that this cannot happen by consensus. Operationally, it is impossible in the Haitian context. Either power is seized by force by a future dictator or a democratically elected president, through cunning political maneuvers, personal charisma, or favorable circumstances, imposes himself as the country's indispensable leader, much like Duvalier and Putin. However, this dictatorial regime will not survive, will solve no long-term problems, and its promoters will meet a tragic end, as in 1986. The Haitian population has a strong historical memory of the oppression and abuses under the Duvalier dictatorships. There is a widespread desire for democratic governance and human rights, and any attempt to establish a new dictatorship would likely face fierce resistance from civil society, political opponents, and the general populace. In today's digital age, information spreads rapidly, and attempts to suppress dissent can be quickly exposed. Social media and independent news outlets would make it difficult for a dictatorship to control the narrative and conceal human rights abuses or corruption. A new dictatorship in Haiti would likely face significant diplomatic pressure, economic sanctions, and isolation from the international community, making it difficult to sustain itself. And the Haitian people will not go back. Despite the failure of democracy in Haiti after 1986, there have been several notable gains for the Haitian people following the departure of Jean-Claude Duvalier. One of the significant gains has been the increase in freedom of expression. The press gained greater independence, with the proliferation of radio stations, and later, television and online media outlets. The post-Duvalier era saw a significant rise in awareness and advocacy for human rights. This has led to more robust efforts to address issues such as gender equality and child protection. Steps have been taken to reform the judicial system to enhance its independence and effectiveness. While the judiciary still faces significant hurdles, 
These reforms have laid the groundwork for a more equitable legal system. Writers and artists have more freedom in their creations. They can criticize or mock their leaders without feeling worried. No one will be able to steal this freedom from the hands of the Haitian people. All this being said, we are still confused. Democracy has failed, and the Haitian people will no longer accept a dictatorship. So what should we do? Is democracy inevitable? First, what is democracy? Democracy is a system of government where power is vested in the hands of the people, either directly or through elected representatives. It is characterized by free and fair elections, the protection of individual rights and freedoms, and the rule of law. In a democracy, citizens have the right to participate in political processes, express their opinions, and hold their leaders accountable. Citizens are also responsible for respecting the rights and opinions of others, abiding by the law, and contributing to the community's well-being. Citizens must exercise their rights within the boundaries of the law, ensuring their actions do not infringe on the rights of others or disrupt public order. While free to express their views and advocate for change, they must do so peacefully and within the democratic framework. From this definition, it is easy to understand why the implementation of democracy is struggling in Haiti. Obviously, all the presidents elected in Haiti after 1986, except for Francois Maniga, did not have the necessary profile or professional experiences to lead Haiti. This may hurt the feelings of some people watching this video. Sorry, but we must accept the truth. However, it is important to note that the main cause of the failure of democracy is not the incompetence of our leaders. In the next 20 to 30 years, it is highly possible that Haiti will continue to elect individuals with the same profile who may be even more incompetent. This is unfortunate for the country, but it is a reality that must be acknowledged and understood in the construction of our democracy. Voters especially uneducated voters lack access to comprehensive information about candidates' qualifications and policies, leading them to make decisions based on limited or misleading information and based on emotion. They might be more influenced by charismatic leaders, populist rhetoric, or short-term promises, rather than a candidate's competence or long-term vision. As mentioned above, this is not the main cause of the failure, although it's part of it. The main reason for the failure stems from the continuous disruption of the democratic order by fabricated crises driven by purely partisan motives, with no consideration for the rule of law, the collective good, or the country's international image. <laughs> When opposition leaders use violence in the streets to challenge the government, it undermines the rule of law. Instead of resolving political disputes through legal and democratic processes, such actions encourage a culture of lawlessness where might makes right. This weakens the foundations of a democratic society, where disputes should be resolved through dialogue and legal mechanisms. Violent protests create a climate of continuous political instability and more problems than the evil the protests are against. It discourages investment, disrupts economic activities, and can lead to economic sanctions, all of which contribute to economic decline and increased poverty. In a democratic election, it is not necessarily the most competent candidate who will be elected. Eventually, the incompetence of the elected official may become evident during their administration. However, their mandate obtained by universal suffrage remains sacred in a democratic context. Furthermore, the violence and instability created to break a presidential term is more harmful for the economy and the well-being of citizens than the inevitable errors of any government led by competent or incompetent people. We should leave this culture where the cure is worse than the disease. And up to now, 
Recent history in Haiti has shown that changing leaders without changing the culture and management practices serves no purpose. This does not mean that the population does not have the right to protest. Of course, the right to protest peacefully is a fundamental and irrevocable right. It is even desirable for the people and civil society organizations to put pressure on the government. However, this pressure should be exerted on elected officials to force them to do what is right for the population, but not to seek to take their place outside the prescriptions of the law. A healthy popular movement that Haiti has seen recently was the Petro Challenge movement, where citizens peacefully demanded justice and transparency regarding public funds that were embezzled or mismanaged. Unfortunately, the movement was taken over by anarchist and opportunistic politicians who had other, more sectarian objectives, and the movement faded to the great satisfaction of the corrupt. Another source of failure is trying to apply a European-style democracy in Haiti. Although democracy emerged in Western countries and powers like the United States seek to impose it everywhere, we must not make the mistake of thinking that democracy is European ownership. Democratic principles such as individual freedom, equality of citizens before the law, transparency, human rights, social justice, and the right to choose one's leaders are universal principles that all people, regardless of race and religion, should not negotiate. To apply these principles without reinventing the wheel, is the duty of each nation to establish the necessary institutions according to its culture, tradition, history, economic capabilities, and existential objectives. For example, one mistake in the 1987 Constitution is the establishment of a dual executive system like in France, with a president and a prime minister. Also, the legislative power in Haiti, with unproductive and corrupt deputies and senators who consume the budget, causes a waste of resources that could have been allocated to education, the Haitian army, or other strategically important institutions for the country. A more rational alternative is to have one mayor per commune, not three, and the assembly of mayors could fulfill the legislative role by meeting remotely or in person to vote on laws or propose laws. This would significantly reduce the financial burden of elected officials and the unjustified waste of public funds. The failure also stems from persistent behavior in Haiti where laws are not followed to the letter. Laws and rules are established to be adhered to precisely. The application of the law cannot be partial, subjective, optional, or hesitant. Ignoring laws creates an environment where corruption and abuse of power can thrive. Officials may engage in unethical practices, misuse public resources, and make decisions based on personal gain rather than the public good. A simple and visible example that shows the contempt for the laws by Haitian leaders is the failure to respect the deadline for declaring assets after taking important official functions. This is not irrelevant. It shows the level of tolerance in Haitian society towards blatant violations. How can you fight corruption that occurs behind closed doors if you cannot take action against illegal behaviors happening right before your eyes? As soon as the deadline passes and the declaration of assets has not yet been made, there should be either sanctions or the immediate dismissal of the official. Only in this way can we foster a culture where respect for the law is fundamental. This seemingly simple act of the declaration of assets is a legal requirement designed to promote transparency and accountability among public officials. However, when leaders ignore this rule, it sends a powerful message that laws can be selectively followed or entirely disregarded without consequence. It is obvious that Haiti was not ready for democracy. The success of democracy depends on various interrelated factors. Key elements include a well-educated population, a political culture that values democratic principles, and strong transparent institutions that uphold the rule of law. However, it was important for Haitians to free themselves from dictatorship and embrace freedom. Now it is impossible and even undesirable to go back. But the democracy or democratic institutions that need to be implemented should not be mere copies of those from Western countries, which do not share the same history, culture, level of education, and economic means as the Haitian people. Let's take the example of the American Electoral College. The American Electoral College system illustrates how different democratic features are designed to align with a country's unique historical context and existential objectives. In the United States, the Electoral College was established to balance the influence of states with varying populations, 
ensuring that smaller states have a voice in presidential elections. This system reflects the country's federal structure and its emphasis on state sovereignty. Although it can result in a president being elected without winning the popular vote, as happened with George W. Bush and Donald Trump, it underscores the importance of each country designing democratic features that support its own goals, such as maintaining regional balance, political stability, or protecting national interests. Since 1986 to the present day, enough data is available to allow for a systemic analysis of Haiti's failure. This process should lead to the drafting of a new constitution that will ensure a better democratic order. Institutions that are sources of failure must be abolished, and new ones can be created. The mechanisms of state functioning must be revised to increase efficiency, allow for transparency, and combat impunity. Two institutions are often cited as sources of instability in Haiti's democracy, the Prime Minister's Office and the Legislature. The division of executive power between the president and prime minister often led to conflicts and power struggles. The president thinks he is the boss, while the 1987 constitution put the levers of power in the hands of the prime minister. We can take for example the conflict between Michel Martelly and Gary Conil in 2012. In addition to power confusion, this dual leadership structure has created inefficiency, as coordination between the president and prime minister might be cumbersome. Maintaining both a president and prime minister, along with their respective offices and staffs, is a drain on the country's limited resources. These funds could potentially be better allocated to other areas, such as education or infrastructure. With only one head of state, the decision-making process is streamlined. The president can act decisively on policy issues, implement changes more rapidly, and respond quickly to crises which is particularly important in times of emergency or when swift action is required. This is even vital for Haiti, which is in the process of nation-building. More power should be given to the president in the exercise of his duties to avoid wasting time seeking consensus, as we will see later, with a parliament that constantly obstructs the executive. The legislative branch has unfortunately been the institution most to blame for the failure of governance in Haiti since 1991. Corruption, blackmail, incompetence, and childishness are among the words that come to mind when thinking of the vast majority of these senators and deputies who have been very costly to public funds. Not only have they been unproductive, but they have also been sources of obstruction, corruption, and even vulgar actions that have brought shame to the nation. Representative democracy with deputies and senators is a Western model that is not currently necessary in Haiti for building its democracy. It costs too much for public finances, while other crucial sectors lack funds. Considering that these legislators bring nothing but trouble in return to the nation, this investment becomes a waste for taxpayers. In the 2018-2019 to budget, 5 billion gourds were allocated to the legislative body, while schoolteachers struggle to receive their salaries and citizens are in great need of health care and potable water. As we have already mentioned, it would be more rational to assign the legislative role to the Council of Mayors. This could result in significant savings for the country, which could then invest that money in the educational system, the police, and the military, which, unlike the parliamentarians, have strategic importance for the country. This would also give more prestige to the role of mayor and encourage more competent individuals from the community to run for this position. Mayors are typically more directly connected to the needs and concerns of their local communities. By empowering mayors with legislative authority, local governance could be strengthened. This decentralization of power might lead to more effective management of local affairs and greater responsiveness to the specific needs of different regions. Democracy is not a perfect system and has many weaknesses. Two in particular should draw the attention of Haitians who are in the process of nation-building. First, democratic processes often require extensive debate, negotiation, and compromise, which can slow down decision-making. The slower pace of decision-making in a democracy, while ensuring that all voices are heard, can sometimes be a significant drawback when immediate and decisive action is crucial. In Haiti, this represents a very significant problem given the difficulty that politicians have in reaching agreements while the nation is collapsing. Granting more executive power to the president can streamline decision-making. 
This could involve reducing the need for approval from the legislative branch on certain matters or allowing the president to issue executive orders in specific areas. At the same time, more power must also be given to oversight bodies such as the Court of Auditors, the ULCC, and the judiciary to counter corruption and abuses of power that may come from the executive branch. Reducing the number of layers in government, such as eliminating redundant roles or merging certain functions, can also help speed up decision-making. In Haiti's current situation, it is better to move forward and make mistakes than to stay stagnant searching for a perfect solution that does not exist. Mistakes are inevitable anyway. Every human endeavor is a work in progress that will involve some trial and error at some point. The second aspect of democracy that causes problems in Haiti is the short-term focus. This is a big problem that needs to be addressed. Elected presidents in Haiti are more focused on short-term gains to satisfy voters and gain popularity, rather than implementing long-term projects and policies that will be more beneficial to the nation's future, but which do not have immediate effects to enhance their popularity. That's why Haiti needs a strategic plan that will serve as a framework for any future administration. It is crucial that goals be set to launch ambitious projects that can span decades. Education, land management, national production, tourism, job creation, territorial protection, the fight against corruption, urbanization, energy production, access to clean water, and access to healthcare are all enormous undertakings that will not bear fruit within a single presidential term, especially considering the country's limited resources. If each term brings a president who only maneuvers with small projects for electoral gains, Haiti will go nowhere. For maximum consensus and legitimacy, the development of this strategic plan and sectoral master plans could involve various stakeholders and experts from sectors such as academia, politics, and civil society. This will make Haiti more convincing to international donors and allow access to substantial amounts of funding to carry out these different projects. Haiti faces unique challenges in the pursuit of democracy. The journey has been fraught with setbacks, and the road ahead is uncertain. Yet, democracy is not a destination. It is a work in progress, a continuous effort that requires the commitment and participation of every Haitian. It is a system built on the collective will to improve, to strive for justice, equality, and freedom. Though democracy is not perfect, it is the only path that allows the voices of all to be heard, the rights of all to be respected, and the future to be shaped by the many, not the few. The alternative, as history has shown, leads only to the silencing of voices, the suppression of freedoms, and the dark shadows of tyranny. In this shared endeavor, every Haitian has a role to play, from the leaders in government to the citizens in the streets. Together, we must forge a democracy that reflects our values, honors our culture, and builds a brighter future for generations to come. The work is hard, the progress slow, but the promise of a better Haiti, strong, free, and united is worth every effort.